a <laughs> bunch of electric people. Oh, we're live. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, uh, everyone. Welcome. Uh, Hi. Everyone tuning in. Great. Welcome to Liquick on Lockdown. I'm Jack Bulwer from Liquick, San Francisco's literary festival and nonprofit. This is our virtual spring and summer series, which streams live to the Bay Area and throughout the world. We created these programs to highlight authors whose book tours have disappeared because of the pandemic. It's a long story, as we all know. Our complete <laughs> lockdown schedule is at liquick.org. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest updates. And we are definitely having a literary festival this October. So stay tuned uh, and sign up for our newsletter to find out more details. Tonight, we are so honored to be able to present uh, Wayetu Moore in conversation with Faith Adiella to discuss uh, Wayetu's new memoir, The Dragons, The Giant, The Women. The publisher is Grey Wolf Press, and we're also co-presented tonight by our good friends at the Museum of the Aspr African Diaspora here in San Francisco. Uh, now, this is a memoir. This is, Wayetu's journey is really incredible. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty harrowing. It begins in Liberia, a civil war breaks out, a rebel soldier smuggles a family into Sierra Leone, uh, and eventually they end up in the United States. Uh, it's, um, I don't want to spoil it any further, but uh, it's an amazing uh, journey. Uh, among, among many other rave reviews, the New York Times has uh, said this book, quote, adds an essential voice to the genre of migrant literature, challenging popular narratives that migration is optional, permanent, and always results in a better life. So. Mm. Oh, in addition to this new memoir, Wayetu Moore is also the author of the magical realism novel, She Would Be King, also on Grey Wolf Press. And she's founder of, and I love this, the nonprofit organization One More, M-O-O-R-E, book, which publishes culturally relevant books featuring children of countries with low literacy rates and underrepresented cultures. One More book uh, also builds libraries and reading corners, and they just opened their book first bookstore in 2015 in Monrovia, Liberia. Uh, more details uh, if you're curious at wayetu.com. Wayetu is a graduate of Howard University, Columbia University, and the University of Southern California. That's a trifecta right there. She is yeah. to us live from her office in Brooklyn, New York. Now, Wayetu will be in conversation with a, uh, an old friend of the Liquid organization, Faith mm -hmm. Adiella author of many books and subject of the PBS documentary, My Journey Home, about mm -hmm. finding family in Nigeria. She teaches <laughs> at the California College of the Arts and she lives in Oakland, California. Uh, a few things before we jump in, uh, please feel free as you're watching tonight to ask uh, uh, people a question. You can use the Q&A feature uh, built into Crowdcast here, or you can also post a, a question in the chat area. You can also support the authors tonight by clicking the green button at the bottom of your screen and purchasing their books that goes directly to bookshop.org and you can uh, pick your favorite indie bookstore to order your copy of their book. We also ask for your support of the Liquid organization to allow us to continue these events. The Bay Area uh, was already a precarious place for artists and arts nonprofits and now things are even more dire uh, so we appreciate any uh, donation you can spare to the Liquid camp as well. So let's get on with it. Um, there'll be some uh, a Q and A uh, a look towards the end. So every we'll uh, we'll definitely uh, be interactive here, and uh, we hope you can join us. Please welcome Wayetu and Faith. Yay. Yay. <laughs> We're back together. Back. It's so great to see you. It's so great to see you too. <laughs> I can't believe it was so recent. We were talking about your novel, and now here you are with a memoir. It's so. <laughs> I know, I know. It, it, it feels like a lot of time has passed, but then also no time has passed at but all. But no time at all. Yeah. yeah. No. This year has had that effect, though. Exactly. Exactly. Indeed. Well, welcome. I'm so glad you could come here. Um, I would also want to extend my thanks to your publisher, Grey Wolf, to Litquake for having us and for all the kind of essential programming they're doing, keeping our love of literature alive during this time, mm -hmm. and to the co-sponsors Museum of the African Diaspora, which I partner with to do an African book club. And we read She Would Be King before, and we're going to read uh, The Dragons, the Giant, and the Women. So I'm really thrilled um, that they're part of this as well. Um, and maybe before we get started, can we have you read a bit? Yeah, 
Yeah, so I'm going to read from a, a short section. So just for anyone who isn't familiar with the work, um, my memoir, it explores the story of my family's immigration to the United States. Um, when I was about five years old, my mother uh, moved to New York to pursue a Fulbright scholarship at Columbia University. But then the war started in Liberia. Um, I had to escape my home with my father and two sisters and actually my maternal grandmother. And um, we, we went on foot, uh, didn't know where we we're gonna go. My dad was afraid for our lives. And we ended up, he resolved that we would hide in my grandmother's village. And um, while we were going there, he saw a soldier hold or a rebel hold uh, someone who he knew on the ground at gunpoint. And he gave that rebel his last change to let this guy go. And the guy ended up escaping to Ghana. And um, he's the one who got in contact with my mother and let her know exactly yeah. where we were. Because before then she hadn't spoken to us in some months because this is a time before cell phones, before anything. And right. so she would, we would have to go to certain phones to reach her, no letters were going through. And of course the American news cycle was a little delayed so she hadn't heard from us in months. This man who my dad helped ends up contacting her, tells her exactly where we are. So the story is about how it was that she found us, how it was that we got to America. And then it's also a story about the assimilation um, journey once we arrived here, um, mm -hmm. being a black woman um, and, and being an immigrant. Because what happens is you do have an idea of America being this emerald city. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then, of course, when, when you're Black, your experience is different from other immigrant groups. And so the mm -hmm. memoir is just an exploration of that. And it's told in four sections. The first is um, five-year-old perspective, me, then it's contemporary, like today. Um, and then it is um, my mother's perspective, and then back to, to the childhood voice. Um, and I'm going to read to you just from the beginning of the... Um, the contemporary section when present day when I um, the events that led me to go and look for um, the woman who helped us to leave Liberia. Okay, and for everyone, I'm going to be reading from a screen today, not from not from the book. Okay. okay. Sata, I was still broken. I wanted a way out from thoughts of him and Sata's memory came to me one night and stayed. It was a dream about her jug of palm oil which she carried like a baby that day she came for us. I woke up and said her name in the dark, surprised to have remembered it all those years later. At that point, I could not remember when last I had been outside. Some weeks prior, I went to a store just below Eastern Parkway, one of the only stores of its kind that still existed among the deluge of coffee shops and yoga studios to buy palm oil and frozen cassava leaf to make the dish I knew would heal me, the only Liberian dish I made that tasted like mams. Mm -hmm. When I arrived, a sign informed me that the store had closed indefinitely. And returning to my apartment, I felt everything I had been avoiding crashing hard into me, tears staining my skin. I have not been able to wash them off for some time. Before moving there, I rid the place of ghosts. I burned sage. The old ma say the spirits do not like the odor. I then called ma'am and asked her to pray, certain they would listen to her voice, ascending in that musical way it did from the, my phone speaker before they obeyed mine. I've been thinking about that woman, I told her that late fall. What woman, ma'am asked. The rebel from the war, I dreamed about her. Oh, she said when the silence overstayed. Have you spoken to Kay recently? A couple days ago, I said, and you've eaten today? I made cereal, I said. Her name was Sata, right? Yes, she said, and she breathed deeply into the phone. You'll be all right, Tutu. A man made that sound of married curiosity and indifference and impossibility, her best invention. Oh. Five or so steps from my bed to the kitchen felt like uphill lunges. I spent too long looking into mirrors, too long sleeping, buried under covers still marked with our collective smell. Every moment I was not working. I had made it to my living room that day and I opened the large window where I placed a vase of ma'am's favorite flowers, lilies, now dried and unrecognizable in the escaping sun. The sill was cold when I climbed onto it 
and I rested my slippers on the fire escape where children played below as we once did, and the Brooklyn drivers honked in the street while bits of conversations and laughter spilled from their car windows on the backs of words like move and fell and going and tomorrow, and the sirens came toward me from the distance, then disappeared again between those words, and the new transplants hurried home, as gentrifiers do when it is almost dark and they are still fearful of corners. I leaned my head against the still and wondered how I smelled, how I looked, if music would ever sound the same, especially those songs I knew by heart. We called shortly after, and I almost did not answer the phone because I didn't care for the questions. How are you? She asked this. She asked this while exhaling, her daughter's loud in the background. I'm fine, I answered. You getting your work done? I am, I said, fighting the urge to look at my computer desk, the remote office where I spent a few hours a day consulting and freelance writing, then glaring into the orbit while an unedited novel sat idle on a minimized screen. Did you get out today? She sighed again. I'm outside now, I mumbled, staring through the holes beneath my feet three stories down to the ground below. Outside, outside, or on your fire escape? I did not answer. So she said my name in that way only ma'am would. Then there was that familiar litany of consolations, fumbling pauses and attempts to make me laugh, her optimism harsh against my ears. She reprimanded her girls every few minutes, and if I were well, I would have smiled. She was that good at it. I'll be fine, I said. I just need time. And I needed my cassava leaf the way they made it in law spread over parboiled white rice drenched in oil with shrimp with dry fish and pepper that wounded my lips reddened my skin and those meats that required both hands to eat new york by my mid-20s the transients allowed around me were already collecting aa chips from too many weekends in chelsea habits that always felt unnatural to me because I have a low tolerance for pain and hangovers. And because the fundamentalist shadow of ma'am and papa's early Sunday mornings in Texas, even during my self-proclaimed late teen rebellion remained. My habit during those years was love stories, grand, provoking, almost silly, intoxicating, plagiarized from romantic comedies and Old Testament scripture. I had fallen in love in that city and then out of it too many times to count. And so I fit in perfectly there, in that way, wanderers like myself do in refined cities, where most wear love like loose garments. But he stuck. We had been together for two years, all of which were long distance. Long distance relationships begin beautifully and suddenly, sometimes by accident. And thereafter, smoke rises not because all is burned to ashes, but because there is always something left in the pipe. This was the other side of love. Everything infuriated me. Everyone was guilty. During the fall after that relationship, the days were long and morning came too soon. The sun crept toward the body, body of that girl hidden under blankets, that girl still running, that girl who lay on bare floors with her Oma, who lay in New England attics with her new immigrant family, and that girl who lay with her sweetheart on an air mattress that flattened during the night while he was in college or in med school or unemployed. In those days, he could not afford a bed. The Omas did not tell us that you could not throw away love once it was finished that it would remain on us like blackened scars underneath blouses and in those places only we could see, that we would reach a point where it, once solid, would melt in our hands and we would never fully wash off its residue, and that some love, the truest love, also the most dangerous, could disfigure our core. Thank you. Oh, right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wow, this is the third time I'm hearing you read from it. And each time you pull something different, which seems to just be the right thing for that moment. So good. yeah, thank you for sharing that. It was incredible. And it, um, the thing that I'm struck by is that when I went back and read it the second time, I realized it really is a fantastic love story. You know, as well as being a memoir, the love story of your parents yeah. um, in there, right? <laughs> well, they're extraordinary. They're just, even now, even now, I mean, they, they moved back to Liberia in 2012 um, after being in the States and raising us in Texas. And, and, mm. and they decided they wanted to go back. And you can tell so much of their decision had to do with their their lives. Their own love story was in many ways um, made dynamic, but also interrupted with right. this move and with the tragedy. So getting to restart that is something I'm, I'm so happy for them. Mm. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love the, um, well, I'm looking at both of your projects and definitely gender is always there. It's always um, mm -hmm. 
We're always doing interesting things. And this has such a fantastic kind of gender reversal when the women come to save the men. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I just like busted out when, you know, when Sata says, your wife come for you. I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, because when you're playing with, you know, mythic fairy tales to start with, you know, and then this, you know, pregnant mother leaves America and is like, you know, patrolling up and down the border with Sierra Leone and Liberia, kind of trying to get her family. Um, it's mm-hmm. really, that's not a character we see normally in literature. Right. Um, Right, right. Who's Sata's character? Well, both. Yeah, both. Both your mom and then Sata. Right? Well, and and they're they're real women. Right. You know, this is real life. Like these are there are a million my mothers, and there were there were so many Satas. Um, some who, while I didn't have an opportunity to find her, I, I was able to have conversations with these women who had done some of the same things. They were risking their lives, and of course. It had um, a cost. They put a price on it and, and and created a trade. And I guess should we explain for mm-hmm. anyone who doesn't know? So yeah, um, you know, uh, social political conflicts um, are usually when it comes to the rehabilitation of those involved, they're 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 usually centered around um, young males, um, boy soldiers. But there are a lot of women who are involved involved in those conflicts as well. Right. And um, it was one of those who played a role in my family, you know, escaping Liberia when we did. And what I found in my conversations was, you know, they would all, most of them, um, with the exception of one, told me that they, you know, there were rebels who came into their village. They gave them an option, you know, you either die or you come and you fight with me or your family dies, you come and you fight with me. So they thought that they were saving their families' lives and were trying to, escape traumas themselves and tragedies themselves. And then of course, once they join, they have to enact these horrible brutalities and the ways that some of them reconciled with, with, with the reality of their situation was they, they created a network and it had a, a system. It was an intelligent network of women who would essentially, they would lie and say, oh, this is my, this is my brother, this is my cousin, or this is, these are my people, they're of my mm-hmm. ethnic group. Right. Um, anytime these people were getting held up at the border or were being harassed for whatever reason. And so then uh, leaders of the rebel factions or rebels themselves would let these families go. And these women then would help these people cross the border. So our families were, were one of them. And then someone, some of them were getting killed as well. Right. And so the fact that this story existed, the fact that these women existed, but when I do read about these conflicts, I would I don't hear their story at all. I thought that it was something that was worthwhile um, because I had a tremendous amount of survivor guilt. And um, in having my conversations, it was a lesson in forgiveness, but then it also challenged me because I was thinking, you know, my family was able to utilize this network and get out, but there were also families who, who suffered at the hands of some of these women. So how yeah. am I changing goodness how am i gauging justice in these contexts you know mm-hmm. yeah but she she wasn't the only one there were other women like her and and there's certainly i think my mom is one of a kind but but certainly right. she tells she tells me she says you know wait till you have children you would do the same thing you would mm-hmm. give anything you would give anything to see your loves again and so she doesn't consider herself extraordinary in any way she just sees herself as somebody who was deeply in love with with her husband and with her daughters um, and with her family, and she wanted to be reunited. Wow, wow, that's amazing. It's such a beautiful story. I really, really appreciate that. And and I love how um, you're, you're engaging with that as well. I mean, you say at some point in the book, there are many stories of war to tell. You will hear them all. Mm-hmm. But remember, among those who are lost, some made it through. And it's um, just so important, I think, because even though we're seeing this incredible renaissance and flowering of African literature, there's still this critique that it's determined by Western eyes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are certain stories we're supposed to tell. And so I see you consistently kind of resisting the classic African tragic tale or that classic immigrant narrative trope. And part of it you do um, through structure. I mean, it was really interesting that, you know, we start in the middle of you know the war coming to a five-year-old and then all of a sudden we're like 20 plus years later <laughs> you know in in uh, 
New York. And even there with the narrator in therapy, she's resisting the idea of the tragic narrative, even though she's like, you know, clearly suffering from some of that trauma. Um, so so uh, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the really interesting yeah. kind of stylistic choices. So, um, so I, 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 I resisted, I, it's interesting that you have that take, but I, because I would say that I honestly resisted the memoir for a long time. I, I'd been mm. writing some iteration of it for a while. And, um, you know, I didn't want to be pigeonholed. I didn't want to, to be labeled through the lens of this traumatic thing that had happened to me and my family. And that's actually one of the reasons that I was vehemently opposed to my memoir coming out first instead of the novel. Mm -hmm. um, and so I approach, I mean, both novels and memoir, I didn't approach my no my memoir any differently than I would my novel. Mm -hmm. um, I was a fundamentalist when it came to the craft of storytelling, making right. sure that the characters made sense and there was motivation for the characters and there were arcs and, um, you know, there were foils, just character, fundamental aspects of, of, of story writing. Um, and that's actually what helped me to determine which which characters or which people, obviously there were, there, there's um, like the foundational characters, quote unquote, right. family members who were part of this story. Um, but then others that I, that I thought did contribute and did, did um, texture mm. it in a way that didn't seem as mundane or as formulaic um, as, um, as, as things that I wanted to, to stay away from. Um, so I just approached it in the same way that I would a novel and like, let me invest in um, these characters. And, and obviously it was strange and um, <laughs> horrific at some points because with, with a memoir, the characters are your family. family right. members. And then in some ways the, the character is you. And so you're doing in the way that you would dissect characters in a novel, once you once that translates to memoir, then you're forced to it's like the, a forced introspection right. um, that no one can compare prepare you for because you are we we have in our minds that okay yes I have this I have this figured out I know exactly what it is why I feel the way I feel and then you write down the things that maybe you've done or that you've thought um, the ways that you've reasoned. And then it forces you to reevaluate um, oh, okay. with, with you know members of, of the family and having conversations with my parents about the steps that they took at different points. And so that that was very interesting. So structurally, I just went about it as I would a novel. Yeah. Um, but then that had that had its repercussions. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. <laughs> um. Would part of that be the chapter that's written in your mom's voice? Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> yes, so initially, so first, the first draft of that, it was first person, and then I changed it to third person. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like I had the right to write that. And then and I, I sent it to her, we had a conversation, and, and it's almost like she gave me the license mm -hmm. to, to write it in her voice. And then, and yeah, you're right, we did have conversations that were very, but we're, my mother is like, she's my best friend. My parents oh. are just, they're just my favorite people in the world. They're wonderful, genuine people who love yeah. life, who love other people. Oh. Um, and so she's always been very easy to talk to. And yeah. so because of that, it wasn't, I wasn't afraid um, of telling her that, hey, I'm talking about this. I, I think my fears came more from doing their, I, I wanted to make sure that I was doing their story justice oh. because such a, a an important and dynamic story my parents right. specifically um right. yeah and so sure. it was for that and then uh, then the tinder chapter of course i had to explain that but that's the only thing i had to oh. explain <laughs> oh, i love that there's just this like small chapter that's like yeah. all these tinder profiles and then it's like left 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 so, <laughs> like... <laughs> and she didn't know she was that she said oh you know I think I went to previous reading, the one that she did, she says, oh, you know, I don't, I was, do you think it was a good idea to list everybody? I said, no, I hadn't dated these people. These, it's tender and having to explain what this meant. So that was awesome. That was the only thing I was afraid about. That's so funny. I love <laughs> so it. Yeah. That was fantastic. There's so much kind of great cultural satire of like all different 
groups there that you know, I want to come back to at some point. But I also just want to talk, um, just wrap up this idea of structure. The thing I thought was so interesting is that, you know, we start at five years old, then we have this flash forward, uh, then the narrator decides to return to Liberia as an adult, um, you know, haunted by this dream. We get the mother's point of view. And then the final, like, picks up. The first sentence of the final final section is like the last sentence of the first section. And it's like, even though we know they got out, it is like heart pounding, like suspense. I was just like, oh my God, can they trust this person? Oh my God, are they gonna make it? Oh my God, I mean, it was so interesting how you, I was like, how did she do that? I mean, the structure is really interesting and it's not, you know, and that's so important too, to say it doesn't have to be told in a certain way. You don't have to say, and then, and then like by playing with structure, mm -hmm. you kind of hint at all the possibilities and all the different ways of shifting around perspective of looking at this kind of complex story. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what, there, there are a lot of comparisons made to um, like fiction and nonfiction, especially somebody who's, who's written both. I've, I've yeah. had this conversation and the difference is, um, it's like this relationship between um, the abstract and the concrete, right? Mm -hmm. So in in memoir, you have all of these this concrete um, these concrete instances and periods in life and um, emotions that you can recollect. Right. And you, for me personally, it was like you know I don't want to just recall, but how can I create abstractions out of these mm -hmm. things? Um, whereas in the novel, you have abstract ideas through um your themes and right. different different elements of the human condition that you want to explore and you're trying to concretize these abstractions right so it's right. the inverse relationship um but for the memoir i was i i didn't want it to, to to just be the concrete like this is what happened i was constantly exploring and challenging how can this be um more abstract how can be how can this be more like me just telling a story as if this didn't happen to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, some of that obviously are the kind of the fantastical elements, which, you know, people are calling magical realism, which I think we debated that last time when your novel came out. But, um, you know, and there are, you know, there's problems with the West calling anything they don't understand magical. But then there's also, and I think, I, you know, I'm thinking about how we'll undo the dragon and mm -hmm. um, Samuel Doe. And to me, that reminded me of like, you know, Garcia Marquez, Autumn of the Patriarch, this just like kind of monstrous creature that goes into the forest and he can't stay like no one can, you say no prince could enter the forest and keep his intentions that mm -hmm. it just like transforms you into something. So um, maybe you can explain what the title means and then kind of talk about the role of the fantastical. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting because, you know, I, in conversations about this magical realism, this term, which I don't, I'm not someone who's hyper emotional about that. Like, I don't, you know, feel any way when anyone labels my work <laughs> as that, you know, but I do challenge people to understand that it is a very Western terminology. And right. in many instances, in many cultures, this is something that it's truth. If there's, what are you talking about magical realism? This is like mm. a truth like you know with the novel as we discussed before my grandmother she it was her truth that this old woman killed her cat and the cat ghost resurrected she you know this that's her truth and so when i was younger and i was imagining these things and i had a perception of what was happening i didn't imagine that i was dreaming or thinking these things mm. up this is my truth right based on the impression of the world that i was given by my my father and my grandmother and my mom before she left New York. And so those fantastical elements when I was writing, it's how 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 can I share how true it was that I believed um, these really radical things were like I believed that we were flying, <laughs> that we were going like when we were in the canoe. I was like, OK, so uh -huh. this Light because the, the way the wind feels against your body, it, it, it does have, it does make you uh, give the sensation of a weightlessness, right? Yeah, uh -huh. um, you know, the, the idea of, yes, I had an idea of a much bigger dragon, but you have like the Komodo dragons and different dragons that live in forests all over the world. Right. We could go to the, that we could go to the zoos, local zoos and see. So I had an image of a dragon and oh. stories of these dragons, these bigger dragons that lived in the forest. So 
in my mind, these things were happening, right? Mm. And so I think what, what I, I think challenge myself to, um, the, in the way I challenge myself and challenge readers is, um, we are, when it comes to magic, it is very, it's relative, right? Um, because what I can, science has a sense of, of magic to it, even those who consider African and indigenous beliefs to be uncivilized and wild. And why is it that we think this way? Mm. Um, I mean, the, a lot of the criticism of these beliefs is that they're somehow unchristian or uncivilized. Right, but right. Being raised in Texas in a very Christian community, we believed that the whole world fit on a boat or the, the entire living world fit on a boat. Right. And, some, <laughs> and the man was swallowed by a whale and lived <laughs> in the whale until the whale threw him up. And then he went to the sea. Magic, this idea of magic and, and how some magic is seen as um, unintellectual, right. um, uncivilized, we really have to challenge ourselves because it really, it is relative. I, and I would never dare go into Texas and telling any fundamentalist Christian that I was raised raised with, raised by, um, who I love dearly, that their version of truth in the world and their reality is not, is not so. Right. Um, because I know how powerful belief is, believing in any one thing, right? How, how, how deeply I believed everything that was happening when I was younger, when my dad was telling me these people were sleeping, these dragons were fighting, and that's the gunshots were drum beats. I believed that. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, so I do challenge people to, you know, even though magical realism, you can call it anything you want to call it. it, yeah. it, it but I, I, I've removed myself from the, the emotional reaction to it, but I do yeah. challenge to think of ma ma magic as more of a relative thing than what we, um, than how we generally consider it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah, those are such beautiful, I remember you talking about this when you said you were writing this memoir. And I, I mean, I was so captivated by the fact that like when you're running and seeing, you know, dead bodies in the road, you know, your father characterizes, you know, the gunshots as drums and that the people are sleeping, you know, in, mm -hmm. just surrounded by red color. I mean, it's just, it's such a beautiful act of love, um, mm -hmm. you know, because you can tell from his body language, he's really freaked out, but that he's, you know, creating this kind of fairy tale world where everyone's sleeping. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just really incredible. I, you know, just fell in love with him at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, so the dragon is the danger, the evil, the corruption. Yeah. The uh, giant's anything. the dad. Well, and the giant's the dad, right? Mm -hmm. And I love there's that moment where he like, he's being bullied and he grows tall in yeah. the way that you couldn't in Houston, really. I was kind of struck by that. Like your magic didn't extend that far, um, mm. you know? Uh, so yeah, he's, um, but inheriting those stories, I think, um, and then finding a place to put them, I think that's involved in kind of the narrator's healing mm -hmm. um, and desire to kind of return to, um, return to Liberia after so yeah. long. Yeah, that idea of magic, I think, really, it became something else almost immediately. I think some, in, my parents always tried to maintain, um, one, they wanted us to stay tethered to our culture in some way, but they did want us to maintain our innocence. And so there were things that, that my mom would say um, that I, <laughs> I believe, like they were, like when I, I asked her once, like, oh, how do, stop, how do the stoplights work? And she thought there were the little people in there that, you know, turned it on and off. And I went <laughs> for a long time because I was thinking, you know, this um, in America, they have like little people who are in, in the lights and why not? Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, Anything um, could happen in America. Yeah. <laughs> there were things like that that I entertained, but I think, you know, in going to, I guess, the, 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 the second overarching theme of the book is, um, you know, the, the experience of Black immigrants in this country compared to yeah. other immigrant groups and how we all sort of come here with the same idea of America as this golden place where all opportunities are possible. And while to some extent that is true and that can be true. And, you know, I acknowledge my privilege and it was certainly true in many ways for my family. I think a, a lot of black immigrants consider 
okay, well, I was able to do this. Why can't anyone else? And not the fact that right. you're able to do this um, in spite of the in institutional structures, right. the structural racism. And um, when I, my mother for a long time, my, my parents are themselves Pan-Africanist. Liberia has a very interesting history, right. dynamic yeah. history. Um, and they, we were always aware of and um, closely linked to and invested in the plight of, of Black people everywhere, mm -hmm. um, being in America, Black people in America. But I did find that there is definitely like a disillusionment um, right. once you've been here for a while and you're working through the system and it's like, oh yeah, we're, you know, we've been here for this, this short time and we're able to do this yeah. and this and this, but it's like, well, no, I was definitely called that word. I was definitely followed around in the store. I, I, mm -hmm. I definitely get um, siloed with other people who are the same race as me, whether or not we have anything in common, just different things right. that are implicitly and explicitly racist. And I think that was when my views of magic began to deteriorate mm. as a kid was seeing that, oh, this place that had been talked up for so long, there's yeah. something else going on here that is very sinister that I need to understand fully, right? Mm. And so for women, I guess to close out your question, right. in the story, it's my mother and it's Sata but it's also my 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 black girlfriends growing right. up who and I call them the black girls. The black girls, yeah. In in middle school, that we were all sort of relegated to this very very small um, conservative white school, and we just they you know we were expected to hang out, and in so many ways they were my education of mm -hmm. America, right? Yeah. And they are very much still my friends now and part mm. of the women in that title. You know, wow. like, what is it that that you learn and how how it is? America is an education. Yeah, right. um, yeah it's an right. education. And I think it can be a very hard education for black right. immigrants because you realize that, um, you know, you 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 your immigration story perhaps doesn't have the flowery ending that perhaps immigrants of other races do. Yeah. And obviously not discrediting so many immigrant groups who are still fighting for justice, still fighting for equality and to be mm -hmm. seen. Um, but I do, I can recognize that there is uh, something that's, that's very interesting that happens psychologically being a black person, but a black person who's between two cultures in a place that sees blackness as criminal. Right. Um, there's a lot going on psychologically um, for those who are raised here with those sensibilities. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I really resonated with all that part in the book because you know I was that girl, but without the black girlfriends, just alone. <laughs> You know? Um, yeah, yeah. you know, so I didn't have any education, you know, yeah, and um, yeah. my documentary actually starts with the lines, though I'm African and though I'm American, I'm not African American. Mm -hmm. And people used to think I'm crazy because, you know, I was saying that like 15 years ago, but now I'm, mm -hmm. you know, people are starting to talk about it now. And I, I think you characterize, you call it the stress of never arriving, kind of mm -hmm. how the black African immigrant has to take on all the African stereotypes and all the black stereotypes, mm -hmm. you know, though you might be in a white environment because of course your parents wanted to go where the best schools were, you know, mm -hmm. so it's like all this like super complexity going on and the parents rarely recognize it because they came to get the stuff. They came mm -hmm. to get the education, they have their church, they're sending money home, they're good, you know. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, they have no idea what it's gonna, you know, what it's like. It's different when you're it's like, different. it's different. Yeah. Although I will say that my dad, he did experience, um, he experienced a lot of racism because he was in, mm. he's in, um, he worked in uh, engineering for a while, and he and those industries down south are are very, right. yeah, very cis, very white, very, um, they're very, very, very male, and he. He's somebody who's always been different. He's somebody who has always been radical in his thinking and the way that he raised us. Mm -hmm. And 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 you can tell he would come home just distressed sometimes. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Same. Yeah.
Yeah, so, so, yeah, really fascinating. Um, and then I love also how um, I could also really relate to then with all the friends who are like getting their DNA tests and dating Nigerians and thinking that's the answer, you know, like if I could just go there and it would be great. And, and you're like kind of trapped saying like, it's not going to be exactly what you think. So, it's, um, you know, you really in not a lot of space, there's not a lot of space in the book devoted to kind of the immigrant experience, but you just cover a lot of ground with like a lot of complexity and also colorism. Um, that line, I could be beautiful in the place and still not enough, just like wrecked me. And there's just like really interesting stuff that happens in the dating politics as well mm -hmm. uh, that I really appreciated. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. It was, it was, um, it was something that, as I said, I'd been writing a version of this book for, for a while and it, and it just took a shape when I returned to, when I returned to Liberia for the first time after being away mm -hmm. for so long. And um, I feel like I was I was empowered with the bravery and the strength to to write a lot of this down, and I'm I'm grateful for that for that homegoing. Wonderful, That's great. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the use of language in the book because there's there's mm -hmm. so much dialogue, which is super impressive, <laughs> and then there's also um, what I'm assuming is pigeon. Um, so the whole thing of like, how does one uh, write dialect? And I don't know if you've heard the audio version, the audio book, but I had some thoughts about that. <laughs> okay. Corona. So because of COVID, I, okay. couldn't, I couldn't record it. And okay. so we had looked, we waited and generally you can wait a, a fairly, fairly last minute for audio books, but um, I was signed on to do the audio book and everything. And then a, a oh. COVID happened and all of the studios closed down. Okay. And we were trying to look for some other studio. And I said, well, I could do it at home. And they said, well, no, you need a professional studio. I was like, well, I can make one in my home. They said, what, right. so what floor do you live live on? And I said, oh, I don't have a base floor. Because they're very precise with, with the audio requirements for that. So I didn't get to do the audio book for this one. Um, but you know, I, I, I think that she, she did a good job for what she was given and then it was it was last minute as well. Mm -hmm. um, I asked, my only specification was don't do any accents, just read it. Um, but so yes, to my understanding, there were some accents. Oh, that yeah. Were, yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing I can do. I'm, I'm grateful yeah. that she was able to, you know. Yeah, no, I'm not trying to make you upset about it. I was just, I just thought it was interesting, you know, so then I was like, is my understanding of, of Liberian accent and dialogue off. <laughs> Super it's, it's, no, it's not. It's not off. It's not okay. off. It was. Um, it was. It. it it's not off. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, what was it like? I mean, you've got a really, really young narrator, age five, recalling things. So we've got you know huge bits of dialogue, and then also stuff written in dialect. So I was just wondering how you how you access access that stuff, how you decided to put it on the page, just um, mm -hmm. we had a lot of writers in the audience too, so I'm sure they'd love to hear about that. Um, how, with, well, with I, I, it's probably the most intimidating part of, of writing Liberia is making sure I get that right, because also, so Liberian pigeon, colloqua is what we call it. Mm -hmm. Colloqua itself has different dialects, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, when I go and speak, if you hear Liberian English, sometimes you, it's indecipherable. Um, some of the dialects are indecipherable from, from each other, but then in many times you, you, you wouldn't be able to tell what's being said. It sounds like another language, but the words themselves are English. Um, right. And I, I do recognize that the Liberian English that I, I know, um, it's really just my parents and they're still very used to um, a, a very specific kind of Liberian English. So I'm, it, it is something that's intimidating. I do a lot of listening, but with the language parts, I'll have people read it and mm. let, and let me know what, what they think if I got it right, because I know mm. when I try to speak it, I'm so off. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I have an ear for it. And so okay. try to try to write what I have an ear for and hope it translates. And then, and then where there are any gaps, I try to get other people to, to read it for me. Oh, interesting. Okay, that's very, very cool. Wonderful. Um, well, we're probably going to go to questions. I just I wanted to ask you one last thing about um, you had mentioned what 
well, okay. So you opened this bookstore in Monrovia and you were talking about initially there was like a little resistance to like, who is she? I get this too. When I go back to Nigeria, there's like, who is this white girl? <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just hoping you could talk just a little bit about how you've managed to get the store, how to partner with local people and kind of, because um, yeah. it was a really great story. Yeah, so I mean, I hope I don't get teary yet. So we, we we opened in 2015 and have been running for the past five years. But I realized pretty pretty early on that I needed to extract myself, um, mm. because, and I had to check myself and make sure that I didn't have these ideas of what um, what helping Liberia looked like, right? Because mm -hmm. I'd gone to a local store. I was flying back to America, gone to look at local bookstore. There were th two or three in the major city in Monrovia and um, asked for a novel. And they just said, what class? Meaning if I'm reading, it's for school, it's for a reason, right? And while there were like reading rooms and libraries, different places, I, I couldn't believe that there, was a, what, there, there wasn't a place where I could go to purchase books because in my parents' stories of Liberia, it always included Mm. Just this, this vibrant culture. Culture was so important. So you had museums, you had your bookstores, you had your theaters. And we don't talk about enough how culture is a casualty of war. You have mm. these people across the world and across history mm. that their cultures risk getting wiped out or are successfully wiped out because of war. Right. Um, the artists usually go first, unfortunately. And so right. I... Um, I wanted to go and open open a bookstore. So then I opened a bookstore and most of the clients at the very beginning were expats or repats. Yeah. And the local community just wasn't coming in because if they mm -hmm. have spent $5, they're not going to spend it on a book because right. look at how much do people make once a month. So I had to recalibrate and just go back mm -hmm. myself and realize that when people pass by the store, they're like, oh, you know, um, the when, if they see the wrong people in the store, when they see too many expats, too many repats, it isn't something that's associated with, um, it, it, they don't feel like it's theirs. Yeah. And, and I knew that that was a problem. So hire, hire local people in the area and then also partnered with a really wonderful organization called Teach for Liberia. Mm. And um, Teach for Liberia is, and we hired a teacher to go in and teach local classes. Um, and so that got, so mm. it's, it's now used as a community center. So people yeah, can come in and read. Um, and then later this year, we're, we're actually changing locations from where we are and trying to um, partner with the university um, so we can work with students, work with more, just serve the community a bit more. Like mm. I said, there's been a lot of recalibration of even myself um, checking my privilege in this space, right? How much mm -hmm. of right. like. I want a book. I want to be able to read a book on the plane where, as opposed to what kind of books do they want or what kind of books do, do they need? Right. Because right. most people were coming in, like, do you have a Bible? <laughs> well, for a while, the Bible would sell out. None of the novels did, but the Bible sold out. And yeah. I was resistant to, to just having, you know, one book that was, um, that was constantly pushed. It's like, Oh, well, why don't you, read some of these other ones, but then isn't that imposing, right? Mm, mm. And so it, it was, it's a wonderful, wonderful lesson and exploration in the ways that our culture changes um, as right. we change and as we move around the world. And um, like how we, we talked about being cross-cultural and living somewhere in between that margin and finding a home there and finding a place there. Right, right, oh, that's beautiful. That's great, that's great. Yeah, and I mean, we're seeing that we're seeing that in Liberia. Like, there's a huge reading culture now. So oh. yeah, and there's a huge reading culture in Liberia now too. So a lot of what's happening, there are young people who are just fantastic, and they're starting these blogs. And so people go and read web magazines. There also journalism is huge there. Free journalism. There are people who are going in trying to do whatever they can to. Um, to publish that way. Um, we have one or two local publishers um, who try to publish novels and poetry, but the the biggest thing in um, the biggest thing in um, in Liberia right now is is textbook publishing and even the the writer mm. 
that's how they work, which isn't too different from <laughs> from America. Is that you 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 sort of find your way in in technical writing first. I mean, I was a grant writer before I sold my first book, so mm. so it's similar there. It's just there there. But it's growing. I think I, I have a lot of faith for this younger generation that's coming up because they're doing really interesting work um, online. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 That's really helped. Um, yeah. Writers, photographers. I mean, Africa can have a huge impact because of social media and online stuff. It's really mm -hmm. shrunk the world. So that's super exciting. Great. Do we have more questions? Just pop them in the ask a question box. We will get back to you. And someone asked if there are publications in local languages. There are some publications in, in local languages. Um, there are some publications in Pigeon. Um, my publishing company is a writer, Rob Tell Paley. She did um, something in Basa. I think a lot of the um, issue of people putting things in, in local languages, which there are um translation there's a translation department even at the university of liberia and they do really wonderful work they translate bibles all the time <laughs> in the languages but um you know there there isn't some of them are standardized i know with by by has a script mm -hmm. and so they try to write it out phonetically but if you go to cape mountain and try to talk to a by person about um, you know, they're to, to read the letters instead of script, it'd be like, well, what is this, right? So mm. there's a lot of those negotiations that are happening now. I think the biggest um, the biggest project is finding a way to standardize Liberian English um, because it is, it is that right. idiosyncratic that it does deserve some attention because it does have its own system of, of um, grammatic rules and even spelling rules in some instances. Um, but people are writing in Liberian English um, and speaking in Liberian English at home. But then when they go to a job interview, they're looking at their, their sheets of paper like, what is this? This is in English because, of course, these industries that are hiring in Monrovia are expecting um, uh, the Queen's English or American English and not Liberian English. So that's one of the, um, the projects that's uh, our foremost intellectual, Dr. Elwood Dunn. Um, uh, Carl Patrick Burroughs, he's another one who's wonderful, and they, they've all been sort of championing for finding ways to standardize Liberian English, as well as Rob Peely, who's yeah. an academician, who's Liberian, does really wonderful work and research. Perfect. You have a um, question here about representation, and I remember you said something really beautiful, like when you come from such a small country, you're used to everyone else telling your story. And the, and the question here is, you know, kind of what sort of pressure do you experience having to represent Liberia if in fact you do feel that? No, I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't feel that. I feel I, I want to tell Liberia's story, but I, I think I've, I try to recognize and try to share that it is my version of a, of a, a very broad story and the way that I, that, that I push against, um, being somehow the only rec representation of a place, which is, come on, that's too much, is I try to champion other Liberian writers. Um, there are some who publish overseas who haven't gained entry into the West yet, or they publish widely overseas. Like by, in Nigeria, there's a publisher called Cassava Republic. She does just right. wonderful, wonderful work, and she publishes Liberian writers. So um, anytime I have an opportunity to to talk about Liberian writers and push people their way, I say go there and and have exposure and um, and uh, um, yeah, exposure to other Liberian writers. And I can give you some names. Bamba Sharif is one of them. He's a Netherlands-based writer, and um, he has some English books though. And he's he's Liberian, but was raised in the the Netherlands after living in Kuwait for a while. Um, also, Hawa Golakai is really wonderful. Um, she is, she's just dynamic and I can't wait until, I mean, people, she's great now everywhere, um, but she's just beginning. She's just, she's fantastic. Yeah. Also, we're, we're discussing her on Sunday in our African book club, actually. <laughs> no, she's great. How is wonderful. Um, Peace, uh, Peace Adzo Medi. She actually has a book coming out in the fall with Algonquin Press and it's called his his only wife it's mm. wonderful she's a liberian ghanaian and it, it's mm. about this um this nigerian guy 
who his family's trying to uh, set him up in an arranged marriage with a, Ghan a Ghanaian guy. His family's trying to set him up in an arranged yeah. marriage with a Ghanaian woman because uh -huh. and to try to get him away from a Liberian woman. <laughs> it's so funny. It's like the funniest, one of the funniest books I've read in, in, uh, in, in the past few years. I think maybe with the exception of My Sister, the Serial Killer. And so I'm looking forward to that. that that's coming out of the wall. So the way I, I push against that and resist it is just, you know, reminding people that there there is other work out there. There's a huge industry, mm -hmm. publishing industry on the continent. You just have to look. There are a lot of people writing yeah. and creating, um, and they might not have as large a, um, a following or a canvas or whatever um, to share their work, but they are out there. They're, they're quality, really, really, really good writers. And so, yeah. Yeah, that's good. but people should buy your novel because it is about the founding of Liberia and it's like fascinating and fabulous. So you all do need to check that out <laughs> as well. Um, people are asking um, any particular themes that arise in the work by young people. I guess that maybe the writers you were talking about, the up and coming the people. Blog, writing the blog. The blog. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there, there's a lot of, um, recently there have been explorations of ethnocentrism in Liberia. Um, sexuality, uh, is pretty consistent because gender justice is something that, um, Liberia seems to always be struggling with, even though we had the first, uh, female president on the continent, first woman president on the continent. Um, right. but gender justice is a huge theme. And then, um, yeah. sexuality and yeah. Yeah. and yes ethnocentrism perfect great um someone's asking what was the impact the emotional impact of writing the memoir for the you emotional impact. um i would say it wasn't it wasn't about writing the memoir it was about going home for mm. the first time um after being away for so long and then after i got over the hurdle of accepting that you know, my my home, as I mentioned to you before, a similar theme is somewhere in the middle of these two countries. Right. Um, <laughs> peace with that, um, then then the the memoir became um, something that was easier to to approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Thank you Daria. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's asking what what books inspire you, writers. What book? Hello? Are you not can hearing? You, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, all right. So writers and books who have inspired me. Um, I'm I'm pretty boring in that way. <laughs> like you you could probably Tony Morrison, Gabriel right. Garcia Marquez, like Ben Oakry, Octavia Butler is just yeah. is everything to me. Um, Sefiata, um, I also mm. am a friend of um, Gujiwa Tiongo. Um, mm. the, in terms of contemporary African writers, gosh, Helen Oyemi, I, I, I love, love, love her work. Um, and then I will say, I am still a huge fan of oral historians. Every time I get to Liberia, which before Corona was about four times a year, and I've been going obviously for the last Wow. Six years or so, I find the oldest Liberian wow. and just sit and say, "Can you like? Can we? Can you? I want to hear stories. You know, I want to hear stories. Tell me everything. Tell me all the things." And that's that's my literature. That was our literature for for such a long time. Um, right. And I actually I, I was in um in the Ivory Coast last year and had a conversation with a griot and she was telling me, oh, we're still around. This mm. isn't a lot of art, we're still around. We still know the stories, we still know the histories. Um, and so those oral history, um, the classical form of storytelling, African storytelling is still really inspires me. That's great. I'm so glad you said that. Let's hear it for oral historians. Um, and this is tied to that. Someone is wanting to know how available are audiobooks on the continent. Um, so not, not, I mean, not, not that I know of, they're not available right now. Um, people, what they will do, I mean, it's, 
the reason why it's tricky is because it's all linked to internet access and because internet can be so spotty, you need a certain amount of bandwidth in order to be able to even download the audiobook. So it gets a bit tricky, but from what I've heard, people are streaming things online, like on YouTube and finding ways. Mm -hmm. um, and on the continent, I can't speak for the whole continent. I don't know what's going on in all <laughs> of those countries, but for Liberia, I know that there are things that are being streamed online because downloading um, ha it has been difficult because of the internet access. Right, right. I think COVID is like creating more things. There was that whole um, African Sans Frontier, like, mm -hmm. um, festival yeah. that was happening you know and it was just like there's so much they have, other events. they have other events i'm supposed to collaborate with them at some point so yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah it's super exciting again yeah social media and anything you can do on your phone i think really mm -hmm. helps open africa up to receiving and creating culture and getting it out there so it's yeah. really really fantastic in that way so great well I yeah, thank you Thank you for taking time out. I know it's late for you. Yes, it's pretty late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so much fun. It's always it's always a pleasure to, to chat with you. And I'm so grateful for Moad and Litquake for this platform and for all of you for your questions and for coming coming tonight. Um, and thank you for reading and supporting. It just means so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really I feel the same way, always excited when you come to town, however you do it. <laughs> wow. Gosh. Uh, can we have a round of applause? For, uh, we got to you and Faith. That was uh, that was fascinating. Look at all the action. People were watching from Australia and Seattle tonight. That was really great. Yeah. That was really great. Thank you both so much yeah, for yeah. your time tonight. Uh, please click the green button and buy uh, Wayetu's new book and also all of yeah. her other books, all of Faith's books as well. Uh, and uh, support the arts. Uh, I love the quote that, that you said, culture is a casualty of war. Right. So make sure we uh, continue to have culture in this yeah. country and in all countries. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, gosh. I was, I was, uh, that was deep and heavy and also really full of life. Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, so, uh, Liquid continues uh, next Tuesday. We have another event uh, um, and next Thursday as well. It's a blur, it's the lockdown blur. So, go <laughs> for, for all of your uh, uh, streaming needs and uh, until we can walk around and hug each other, this is sort of the way we have to experience literature. Yeah. But uh, thank God we're able to do it. And, um, yeah. You know, it's a, it was a, it was, it was a, it went by so fast, you guys. Yeah. Really, really yeah. Well, so, thank you for oh. staying. It was a good fun. All right. Thank you both. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Okay.